Hello, brothers and sisters, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. This is Micah from the two LDS archives. Once again, some housekeeping. I've said this at the front of, I think, my last three videos. I keep getting asked about the two. It simply means me, my wife. That's what it means. Why black and red? I like black and red. That one seems to be a question that people really want to know about. Well, there it is. Um, also, um, I have been contacted by Troy again, who wants to do that interview. We'll see what happens. Um, we're having to work it out through the missionaries and um, through the email with them at the church because I don't. I live out in the boonies, so I have to go out to do Zoom at the church. And the missionaries are going to work it because Troy is uh, inept with technology, just like me, and we both don't know how to work Zoom. So the missionaries are going to hook it up for us if it works. Also, we've been receiving some complaints about the email, or not the email, the website, the blog. Um, we've contacted Weebly, and uh, they have told us that it is not on their end, it is on people's end, and they need to clear their cache, I guess. And when we've told people to clear their cache and, and history, they've stopped um, experiencing problems. So, if you um, clear your cache, and your history, and it still doesn't work, please get in contact with us, and we will um, see what we can do. But we haven't had anybody who's complained about it after that. Also, these are all in Word. I have people trying to download these on um, tablets, and I don't know if they have Word, and therefore it is not working. Um, we can transcribe all of these into a PDF as well, um, and I don't think that would be too difficult for us to do. I'm not sure if PDFs open better on tablets. Somebody would let me know. If no one's really interested in that, then um, um, then we won't do it. But a uh, couple people say, yeah, actually, PDFs would be better. Then we'll start adding PDF versions of all of these as well. And I believe that that is it for the... bookkeeping. So this paper, Importance of Mothers, this is a talk that I wrote, jeez, uh, four, four years ago, five years ago. I don't even know if, maybe four or five. I don't know if um, my son was born yet, um, but I kept it. And I think it's important right now, especially with what's going to be happening ahead in the days of tribulation. Um, I think that this is a good thing to get out now. As always, you can go to the blog you can download all of these for free. Um, this one's written in a little bit of a talk format, so it might be um, a little bit different than my other ones, because um, I didn't edit this one very much, um, obviously, since I gave the talk. Um, and so um, it will be different in that regard. So let us go into it. So I say, Happy Mother's Day to all. When I found out that I would be talking on Mother's Day, I had to have a few good chuckles with my own mother. You see, my mother's least favorite Sunday all year is Mother's Day. Every year, the speakers would get up and they would talk about their one-eyed, one-legged mothers who'd walk them to school every day on their peg leg and then would play catch with them after school, but would catch most of the throws with their face or her face because the mother didn't have any depth perception because she was missing that eye only to spend the rest of her waking hours cooking, cleaning, and making all of the children's clothing by hand, etc., etc., etc. Now, by the end of the talks, my mother would feel like crap. Because, you know, in my mother's eyes, she was, she's a lesser mother to all of these clearly super mothers. So I told my mother before I gave this talk, I said, Mom, don't worry. I'll give a talk about how horrible my mother was, and make sure that all the other mothers go home happy. She chuckled when I told her that, but then reminded me that she still knows where I sleep. Now, I don't believe that there has ever been a time when real mothers, real motherhood, has ever been so discouraged, so belittled. By the end of my talk, I hope that we will have a better understanding of just how crucial mothers are and motherhood is, and a stronger appreciation for the strong women in our lives. And if this was a problem four to five years ago, 
It is an ultra problem today. It's a plus ultra problem today. In learning history, we can identify eternal truths. And with eternal truths on a timeline, we start to see patterns. This is the primary reason for the recording of scriptures. So we can learn history, identify eternal truths, see the patterns, and then liken them unto ourselves for our salvation. One such pattern that is talked about a lot with regards to the Book of Mormon is the pride cycle. Now, the pride cycle goes as follows. One, hard times create humble people. Two, God blesses humble people, obe humble, obedient people, creating good times. Three, good times create prideful, disobedient people. Four, God curses prideful, disobedient people, creating hard times. Now, Eternal truths and patterns can be and are identified in history. Regardless of the lens of faith, historians and professors have noted many patterns with regard to the rise and fall of civilizations. Such patterns, when heard, will sound eerily familiar to spiritually taught patterns, such as the pride cycle, when they are grounded in eternal truths. One such pattern that you most likely have heard of, or at least a version of, at some point or another in your lives, goes as follows. One, hard times create strong women. Two, strong women create strong men. Three, strong men create good times. Four, good times create weak women. Five, weak women create weak men. Six, weak men create hard times. The eternal truth in this cycle is that women raising children have the potential to create strong children or weak children, and those children will shape the future. This eternal truth is obviously known to God and those who follow him and his teachings, but it is also known by Satan and those that follow him as well, as many people in between the extremes. One such example of a group of people who understood this eternal principle is that of the Romans. The Roman civilization were masters at conquering civilizations and then making them subservient, absorbing the remnants, and then rinsing and repeating. How did they do this so successfully? Because the Romans knew the eternal truth of motherhood. When the Romans finished killing all the nation's men, or selling them into slavery, or putting them in the Colosseum, they would find a child who had broken a Roman law. And then they would take the child out and make all the women watch as they killed the child. They would then tell the women, to control their children and teach them Roman law, Roman culture, Roman gods, so that their children would not meet the same fate and would be saved. The women would then raise weak, subservient children who feared death. The mothers would abandon their gods, culture, way of life, etc. for the security. This made absorption of the newly conquered peoples into Rome easy. They knew that if they got the women, they'd teach their children, doing their work for them. They knew that if they... Uh, oh, sorry. In a very similar story. I want to read that twice. It was so important. I shouldn't have been going for the brew. In a very similar story, in the Book of Mormon, a group of Lamanite men went out to battle to protect their nation, their family, their people. But instead of taking up arms, they prostrated themselves on the ground and prayed to God. When the conquering army was finished killing the men and left and or were converted themselves, what did the now husbandless mothers do with their children? Did they teach their children to fear death? To give up on their God? No. 
No, they did not. They taught their children to be strong. These hard times created strong mothers. Mothers that did not doubt. Strong mothers that then created strong men. These strong men became to be known as the stripling warriors who went on to pave the way for the prosperity and survival of the anti-Nephi Lehi's. Another example. Now, there are countless, but I just want to throw out a couple here, being that of the Spartans in Greece. The mothers would tell their sons going off into battle, quote, come home carrying your shield or come home on it, son. During that time period, Greece was dominant. But, when well, mothers in Greece began romancing and glorifying in their effeminate men, then came the decline and eventual destruction of Sparta. A well-versed modern feminist named Camille Paglia has written on this historical phenomenon, warning that Western culture is on the verge of collapse because of it. The Mongols also warned their children, I hate luxury. I exercise moderation. It will be easy to forget your vision and purpose once you have fine clothes, fast horses, and beautiful women, in which case you will be no better than a slave and you will surely lose everything. Although you inherited the Chinese empire on horseback, you cannot rule it from that position. End quote. <clears throat> I don't know if I said begin quote, but there it ends. In modern times, we learn about an extremely difficult time period. So difficult, in fact, that they refer to it as the Great Depression. This time period created some of the strongest women of multiple generations. This group of strong women created the generation of men that is to this day still referred to as the greatest generation. This group of men paved the way for a time period in the West that saw the highest levels of invention, luxury, prosperity, wealth, etc. that the world has literally ever seen. Those are some pretty good times. But these good times in the West gave birth to some of the most evil and vile designs to destroy strong women and mothers and turn them into weak women and weak mothers, the weakest the world has ever seen. The sexual liberation, the destruction of the family unit and glorification of single motherhood, mass materialism, consumerism, and addictive social mediums, to name just a few. It has never been harder to be a strong, valiant woman or mother in the history of this earth. And we have never needed strong mothers more desperately. Isaiah saw this time period and described it thus. Isaiah chapter 3, And the people shall be oppressed, every one by another, and every one by his neighbor. The child shall behave himself proudly against the ancient, and the base against the honorable. The show of their countenance does witness against them, and they declare their sin as Sodom. They hide it not. Woe unto their soul, for they have rewarded evil unto themselves. As for my people, children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. O oh, my people, they which lead thee cause thee to err, and destroy the way of thy paths. Moreover, the Lord saith, because the daughters of Zion are haughty, and walk with stretched forth necks and wanton eyes, walking, walking and mincing as they go, and making a tinkling with their feet. Therefore the Lord will smite with a scab the crown of the head of the daughters of Zion, and the Lord will discover their secret parts. In that day the Lord will take away the bravery of their tinkling ornaments about their feet, and their calls, and their round tires like the moon, the chains and the bracelets and the mufflers, the bonnets and the ornaments of the legs, and the headbands, and the tablets, and the earrings the rings and the nose jewels, the changeable suits of apparel, and the manlets and the wimples, and the crisping pins, 
the glasses and the fine linens and the hoods and the veils. And it shall come to pass that instead of sweet smell, there shall be stink. And instead of a girl, a rent. And instead of a well-set hair, baldness. And instead of a stomacher, a girding of sackcloth and burning instead of beauty. Thy men shall fall by the sword and thy mighty in the war. And her gates shall lament and mourn, and she, she being desolate, shall sit upon the ground. End quote. From Isaiah, Elder M. Russell, M. Russell Ballard, in his talk, Women of Righteousness, said, quote, There is nothing a woman can do that has more far-reaching eternal impact than to rear her children to walk in righteousness. Some women do not have the privilege of marrying or rearing children in this life. Yet, if they are worthy, these blessings will come later. Women who do have the privilege of rearing children will, of course, be held accountable for that priceless eternal stewardship. There is simply not a more significant contribution women can make to, the, to society, to the church, or to the eternal destiny of our father's children than what they will do as a mother. For that reason, I am concerned about what I see happening with some of our young women. Satan would have you dress, talk, and behave in unnatural and destructive ways. The adversary is having a heyday, distorting attitudes about gender and roles and about families and individual worth. He is the author of mass confusion about the value, the role, the contribution, and the unique nature of women. Today's popular culture, which is preached by every form of media, from the silver screen to the internet, celebrates the sexy, saucy, socially aggressive women. These distortions are seeping into the thinking of some of our own women. Remember, Satan wants us to be miserable like unto himself. His plan is to get women so preoccupied with the world's glitzy lie about women that they completely miss what they have come here to do and to become. Remember, and never lose your precious identity, your influence on families and with children, with youth, and with men is singular. We don't need women who want to be like men, sound like men, dress like men, drive like some men drive, or act like men. We do need women who rejoice in their womanhood, and have a spiritual confirmation of their identity, their value, and their eternal destiny." End quote. President Russell M. Nelson said in his talk, a plea to my sisters, quote, 58 years ago, I was asked to operate upon a little girl gravely ill from congenital heart disease. Her older brother had previously died of a similar condition. Her parents pleaded for help. I was not optimistic about the outcome, but vowed to do all my power to save her life, despite my best efforts. The child died. Later, the same parents brought another daughter to me, then just 16 months old, also born with a malformed heart. Again, at their request, I performed an operation. This child also died. This third heartbreaking loss in one family literally undid me. I went home grief-stricken. I threw myself upon our living room floor and cried all night long. Dancel stayed by my side, listening as I repeatedly declared that I would never perform another heart operation. Then around five in the morning, Dancel looked at me and lovingly asked, are you finished crying? Then get dressed, go back to the lab, go back, go to work. You need to learn more. If you quit now, others will have to painfully learn what you already know. Oh, how I needed my wife's vision, grit, and love. I went back to work and learned more. If it weren't for Denzel's inspiring prodding, I would not have pursued open heart surgery and would not have been prepared to do the operation in 1972 that saved the life of President Spencer W. Kimball. 
That's such a sad story, end quote. Elder D. Todd Christofferson said in his talk, The Moral Force of Women, quote, In all events, a mother can exert an influence unequaled by any other person in any other relationship. But the power of her example in teaching her sons learn to respect womanhood and to incorporate discipline and high moral standards in their own lives. A mother's love and high expectations lead her children to act responsibly without excuses, to be serious about education and personal development, and to make ongoing contributions to the well-being of all around them." End quote. <clears throat> On this day of giving gratitude for strong, righteous women, our mothers, let us truly appreciate and, and understand the significance of women or mothers in shaping the world we live in. Let me end this talk with a quote from Elder Neil A. Maxwell from his talk, Women of God. Quote, When the real history of mankind is fully disclosed, will it feature the echoes of gunfire or the shaping sounds of lullabies, the great armistices made by military men, or the peacemaking of women in homes and in neighborhoods? Will what happens in cradles and kitchens prove to be more controlling than what happens in Congress? No wonder the men of God support and sustain you sisters in your unique roles for the act of deserting home in order to shape society is like thoughtlessly removing crucial fingers from an imperiled dike in order to teach people to swim. Finally, remember, when we return to our real home, it will be with the mutual approbation of those who reign in the royal courts on high. There we will find beauty such as mortal eye hath not seen. We will hear sounds of surpassing music which mortal ear hath not heard. Could such a regal homecoming be possible without the anticipatory arrangements of a heavenly mother? End quote. I give this talk with gratitude for my mother and all the strong women that helped shape my life. I pray that we will always remain grateful for the strong women that helped shape our lives. I pray that women, when presented with a choice, will be strong women. I pray that mothers, when presented with the choice, will raise strong men and not weak men. I share this with you in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.